All right, everybody, let's begin. Thanks for joining us here for our second week, which should be third week of this Bible study of the first gospel, the gospel of Mark. Um, last week, for those who were able to join us in person, you caught the avalanche of data and interesting things that ended up being an hour and a half. This week will not. This will be week will be much more tidy. And this week, what we're going to be specifically looking at is Mark 4.35, which picks up kind of where Amy's sermon from this last week left off, to 5.20. That's the, that's the stories that are sandwiched in between there. So it's Mark 34, 35 through 520. Uh, and before we fully, fully jump into that, um, I'd like to say a couple notes about communication in the ancient world. All right. So uh, there's an interesting thing as we, Amy dealt with in her sermon last week, where we were talking about transitioning from those introductory passages about uh, Jesus and the baptism and the temptation of the wilderness, uh, a handful of miracle stories, um, that weird sandwich technique Mark is using where he pairs stories almost like buns on a sandwich that are similar with the story in the middle sort of being explanatory. We're about to dive into another one of those sandwiches, although we will not get to the meat. All right. So uh, <laughs> that will actually come on Sunday, the sort of getting to the meat of the sandwich. We'll be Thank beginning you. the first part of the sandwich with some well-known stories today. But Thank um you. What Amy spoke about last week is where we actually entered into this phase in Jesus's ministry part where uh, he's doing some teaching. She talked about parables. And um, one of the interesting things you might consider is, and maybe this is a question you've asked yourself, Thank you. how on earth is Jesus supposed to be heard by hundreds of people? Um, and later in, you know, when you look in the other Gospels and you're starting to get to the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000, you're thinking, how on earth is Jesus supposed to be heard by these individuals? Um, you know, maybe he could yell. I'm sure he speaks probably a lot more deliberately. Um, I can't speak specifically to the 4,000 or 5,000 because we don't know exactly where those, you know, one's on the plane, one's on the mount. You know, it's a little confusing. Yeah. But these teaching right here in particular that are centered around Capernaum, there is an interesting geographical feature about Capernaum. Capernaum, like many of the other villages around uh, the Sea of Galilee, which um, if you've ever seen a map, there's a map there printed on the tables. But if you've seen a map of the Sea of Galilee, you see where Capernaum is. Well, that area right there is hilly, but it is not mountainous. And so Capernaum, sits there and creates almost a small natural amphitheater. So we see the context for some of Jesus's teaching where he's out on a boat to get away from the crowds, but just gets out a little bit and speaks himself from the boat. And so he has minimal, it's only just water, maybe the gentle lapping of the water that's, uh, that is uh, causing interference there. But he also has this natural amphitheater of people, which would enable him to speak at a not absurd volume and be heard very clearly by people, which is an interesting feature of his ministry. Because if you think of a hustle and bustle of a city per se, well, you're not gonna be able to hear people as well. If you're in the lower lands like the Shephela that are sort of south of Jerusalem, where it's flatter, you're not going to hear Jesus as well. But this particular locale of his ministry, Capernaum, has these unique features that makes communicating to large audiences a little bit easier. I think that's an interesting feature. When I was in Capernaum, we actually tested this out. We had someone stand on the rocks down below us right next to the water and we sort of sat on the hill above it. They spoke to us in a relatively normal voice and we could hear them clearly. It is a natural amphitheater as opposed to if you've ever been to Greece or Turkey or any place that has an ancient Roman amphitheater, you know someone could stand in the middle of the dais, the stage down below, speak to you in a relatively relatively normal voice and you could be hundreds of feet away and still hear it. If you ever have the um um if you ever have the pleasure of going to Pergamum in Turkey, the ancient site, it is the world's tallest remaining ancient uh, Roman theater. Um, you know, you are hundreds of rows up 
um, from the bottom of it. It feels absolutely absurd how tall it is. And yet someone can stand down there and talk and you can hear them just fine. Now that doesn't necessarily control for your neighbors talking too much, <laughs> but at least that maybe that helps you understand a little bit of Jesus's uh, communication practice. So we're going to pick it up there. We're going to pick it up in verse 35. Um, and uh, we're going to talk geographically uh, speaking. So if you're joining us from home uh, and you have the ability to do multiple windows, I would recommend you um, Googling something that just is Decapolis, D-E-C-A-P-O-L-I-S, and would enable you to pull up a simple map. It, it's not essential, but it might be helpful if you're someone who likes to orient, orient yourself geographically. Um, because there, there's there's some interesting points with that. So let's um, let's look at verse 35, and we're going to read that first pericope, the first story, uh, 35 through the end of the chapter. And do I have a volunteer here that would be able to do that? And I actually have another little mic that I could hand you um, that would enable you to uh, join in the reading. And I just want to make sure those online can hear this other mic. Check, 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 check. check. You can hear that one. So who would be willing to read that for us? Anybody? Anybody? 35 to the end of the chapter. Okay. Let me let me hand you a little mic here. In front of my mouth. Yeah, just kind of hold it. And... That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Debbie, did that come through? The reading come through okay? Awesome. Yeah. Good to know. Um, all right. So let's go across to the other side. Um, one of the things that's interesting to know about the Sea of Galilee, it's famous for a couple of things. We talked a little bit last week about um, it is famous because it's the largest freshwater lake in the Near East. Uh, and so it was well known for freshwater fishing that would have been cured, salted, and sent all over, sent all over the Roman Empire. And so it was a largely, especially among the elite that could afford buying such fish, a fairly well-known region. Uh, maybe even a delicacy to some extent. Uh, another feature about it is uh, if you're looking on a map and you see there upon the eastern side, uh, that area, it's Hippos or Hippos or Hippos, uh, the area there, depending on the map you're looking at, that's the area we would now call the Golan Heights. Well, it's called the Heights because it's high. Uh, there, that side, the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee is mountainous, uh, considerably higher than the western. The Western has gentle slopes around it. Um, towards the South, uh, it's a little flatter where modern day um, Tiberias would be. You see some, some maps do actually put Tiberias on there, which would be in sort of the lower left part of the, the Sea of Galilee, whereas Capernaum is in the Northern part. Um, Capernaum are small hills, but as you look to the West, it's very obvious if you can see across uh, the Sea of Galilee, that there are very tall mountains there. Uh, they're not jagged, they're kind of flat top mountains, but there are mountains. So it creates this interesting effect where warm air coming from the east, which would have been because that's very deserty beyond that. I mean, the whole area is pretty deserty, but the city of Galilee area can be pretty humid. It's kind of a unique little enclave there in the ancient Near East. Warm air coming from the east would be meeting air coming from the ocean, which could be warm or cold. And depending on the weather of the time, it could create a dangerous mixture where air is coming up top and air is coming below. And if those happen to be different temperatures, it can create violent storms almost like that. 
So in the short time I was at the Sea of Galilee, it was relatively calm, but you could turn your eye away for 10 minutes and all of a sudden it is a violent squall. So you kind of thought, I don't know if you've ever thought to yourself, well, if I was thinking about going from this side of the lake to the other side of the lake, I think I would look out across the lake and I would say, well, that looks <laughs> there. Let's not go. That's pretty reasonable. But it's also an understandable understanding that, that one could shove out across the lake on a perfectly clear looking day and all of a sudden be caught by a storm that you didn't see coming because obviously in the ancient world, they did not have radars and did not have, you know, air temperature sensors in order to say, uh oh, there's a possibility of a storm coming. So they maybe looked to the mountains, tried to see if there were clouds up there, storms up there to guess, but it's entirely possible that in this case, we see of this story that um, you'd shove out and it would just boom, pop up and it would be, and they are known to be violent. Uh, keep in the context of this, what is the profession of many of the disciples? Fishermen. Fisherman. So they are absolutely familiar with life on the water, and yet they were terrified. Part of that could be as a fisherman, maybe they don't make a habit of going out into the deep, deep waters in the center. Maybe they do so sparingly. Many people in the ancient year world, even mariners, um, when you think of sea travel in our age, we, we usually think of going the shortest point, you know, the, the, the path of uh, the shortest path between two dots, whereas in the ancient world, they more than likely would have sailed in a way that kept them close to shore. How else would people like Paul be able to survive multiple shipwrecks? Uh, because you would wreck and you'd be close enough in order to float or get yourself to shore. Um, and so maybe as fishermen, they're tending to stand stick closer to shore. They know where the fishing grounds are. It doesn't mean they're just going out on a jaunt, but they are very familiar with traveling in water, and yet they were terrified, which gives you a certain understanding of the nature of this storm. So um, we have talked about, about shame and honor culture. I talked about that in the very, very first sermon. In the second sermon, we talked about this a little bit last week. It's always something to keep in mind that showing fear, this type of behavior that the disciples took on fear and, and worry, showing that in many ways would have been considered a serious loss of honor to the Mediter Mediterranean male. In many ways, they, it could mirror what we understand as more toxic elements of masculine culture in this age, where someone, someone, it's not, it's not proper for a man to show they're afraid. They need to always be tough and and upright. Uh, and so that element, I think, we have some similarities there with those two different cultures. That would have been a loss of honor for these Mediterranean males to be freaking out and going crazy like this. So. Um, I want to pause here and just say, what are some interesting things maybe you read this week in this that you'd like to bring up or questions that you had in this specific area? And then we can get in more of the notes and things we have. Anything that jumps out to you about this first story? Anything you've struggled with or liked about this story in the past? Uh, that's an interesting idiom. So the question was, what does verse 36 mean? And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. Other boats were with him. Um, I'm assuming what that means is he was previously teaching from the boat. And so they were communicating that they didn't necessarily come into shore to go back out to shore. That's just a guess. It might be an ancient idiom for... Um, Jesus didn't need to change clothes. I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I doubt there's some real major um, theological significance to this. Any other thoughts? Question I got is, um, he's probably surprised that they are afraid. Yes, yes, that's an interesting, the disciples are, Jesus seems surprised that they are afraid. I think the a dynamic that is happening there, and we'll get into this, and this becomes really obvious as we put this lens on, is um, the disciples in Mark, just as we talked about this theme of Jesus is always sort of being tested and he's found to be worthy, the disciples are always being tested and found to be unworthy. So there, there's a real, Mark generates this really you know, interesting relationship with the disciples. They're always bumbling and stumbling and not getting it. 
And so it, it, it kind of pits Jesus against them and us against Jesus about, you know, Jesus in many ways is flabbergasted. that They still don't understand him. <laughs> they still don't. You know, you've seen us. You've seen me heal people. You've seen me cast out unclean spirits. And yet you still don't understand me. Now, I think there's a reason for that. And we're going to get into that here in a second. Um, but that I think that's a little bit what's going on. And some of it, to be honest, is Mark as an author is probably dialing that up a little bit to sort of create a hyperbolic moment of distinction between the two. Um, you know, keep in mind, we read this from a scenario where we know the ending of the story. They're participating in a story where they have no clue where it's going. So their relationship to Jesus is evolving. And although they don't really even seem to get it, to be honest, even after Jesus has died and resurrected, they don't seem to get it. It seems to take decades for them to get it. And I think that's an element that's in here. So this is where we're going to transition. I'll transition a little bit. How big are the boats? That's a great question. How big are the boats? So uh, there's a really interesting thing in one of the, uh, one of the Knesset, or not the Knesset, the Gennesaret, one of the little communities that you can stay in. And um, there's um, there's all these areas that they're in modern Israel called kibbutz. It's sort of this, there was a movement if you've ever read about that. And so there are these managed resorts that are sort of like enclaves where people live and work. Um, and there's one, I've actually stayed in this, that has a museum attached to it where they have excavated, they had found in the mud and the mire of the lake there, a boat. Uh, you know, it's it's colloquial. Some people call it a Jesus boat. It has no real connection to Jesus. It's just archaeologically speaking, it's the best example of this. So, I mean, you can actually Google this when you go home or if you're home right now, the Jesus boat. Uh, I, I, I wish I could give you the more proper name of what it's associated with. Um, they're not big. Uh, you know, they're larger than a modern canoe. But for those sitting here in the room, I, I would say the length of the part that you would actually sit in is no wider or is no longer than the distance between the ends of the table. So 15, 20 feet at its widest point, maybe seven to eight feet. They're not terribly large boats. They're not, you wouldn't call them canoes, but it's not some large seafaring vessel because why would it have to be? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, look that up. It's really interesting. It gives you a real good sense of the scale of it. So not huge. You know, I think they would see a modern, one of our modern pon pontoon boats pontoon boats and it would just blow their mind um sails or... yeah they can they can have sails yeah i think it just depends on the purpose of the boat i mean i'm sure they had smaller boats where they were just rolling around but it would have it would have had a sail in it in the middle like a center mass that would have taken them um but not a terribly complicated vessel so well, if you notice, if you notice, it it makes the distinction makes the distinction that not everybody traveling over there is in the same boat. So I think it's within the bounds of the story that the you know you could have multiple boats together, disciples across all of them, um, you know, really worried. But I but you could get twelve people in one boat without a problem. I think I think the more humorous part of the story is this storm is so severe that the apostles who are used to life on the water are terrified, and yet Jesus is asleep. I mean, that's, that's the really funny, humorous part of the story. So uh, one of the distinctions that's happening here is up until this point in Mark, we have seen miracles, but they are miracles associated around control of the human body, um, specifically when it comes to healing. Remember, healing with the hand with the withered hand, but also the uh, expelling of unclean spirits. So this storm is the first what theological theologians would call natural miracles. This is Jesus demonstrating power over nature. And that's a significant departure from what the apostles had experienced prior. Um, and so that, I think that's an important point to think of here. So um, let's see. Another thing to keep in mind is the, the, the idea of storms. Um, Nashville might be an interesting place to talk about this because we have become bruised and battered by wind storms in recent years, but we don't necessarily associate that with supernatural stories. And the ancient Near East, storms would have been connected with apocalyptic events or um, other myths of the creation story. So you're probably familiar with the, uh, the Gilgamesh epic. 
which is an ancient uh, story that involves water. Water is associated with chaos. Um, in the book of Revelation, we see water associated with the Leviathan. And so there are elements of water that are in and of themselves, not just scary to be on an ocean that is going crazy or a body of water, but at times you can feel like there is a supernatural element to it, either because of sea beasts that you cannot see or but because there are natural godlike elements controlling these waters. And so, you know, I've heard people say before, if, you know, if modern Americans are beach people, ancient Israelites are mountain people, they're not beach people. Uh, not fans of water. It's sort of a necessary embrace of chaos to make your living off that water. So that that's an element in this. So when when they are terrified at this that this storm, it's not just oh my gosh, I'm worried that I'm drowned and we don't have lifesavers. It's I am worried there is some sort of primordial evil or primordial spirit that is causing these things to happen. So it's it's a different type of fear. Um, Creation itself, if we're looking at the book of Genesis, is often described as a struggle between God and the sea. Remember, the waters weren't created, the waters were parted, um, which is an interesting thing to think about. So um, another thing to think about as we begin to interpret this, understand this, early church fathers, the early church um, began to associate boats or passages in a ship as symbols for the church itself. So the earliest, the earliest symbols of the church are often depicted as boats when you find in early church art, which makes sense in all that context we're just talking about. Jesus being in the boat, uh, you know, us being in the boat, the church, it is saving us from those sort of allegorical seas of chaos. A lot of Lutheran and the Scandinavian churches look like boats. That's true. Yeah, that, that is a common thing. Yeah, the, the university I actually went to, its chapel had subtle things in it to make you remind you of a boat. It had a big metal plate at one point in the floor that was meant to, rem that was actually said, you know, this is where the mast would be and things like that to remind you this is, this is a boat. Now, of course, that overlaps obviously with arc imagery from the Old Testament, but you know, that's how the Bible is. The Bible is one of the more self-referential books you would ever read. So always referring to itself. That's true. That is true. Absolutely. We're po the portion where people sit is a nave, or is referred to as a nave. So um, uh, Augustine, St. Augustine, one of the early church fathers, you know, he takes this sort of allegory a little further. He says, the wind, the wind represents the abuse the faithful suffer. The waves suggest the anger that swelled within them. The danger of the boat mirrors the dangers of their heart like the disciples. One should rouse Christ whose presence they have forgotten. Uh, ingenious as the allegorical interpretation is, we can see how some of that maybe fall flat, but that's the way Augustine in some of his early sermons would refer to these passages. That was a common motif in early church fathers is uh, interpreting certain passages extremely allegorically in a way that would seem almost foreign to us right now, but that's the way it was. Um, so uh, Jesus is asleep. What a hilarious, hilarious thing. Other other synoptic gospels <laughs> sort of expand on some of this a little bit. Um, teacher, why do you not care that we are perishing? Uh, he woke up and he rebuked the wind. Isn't that interesting language? Do you notice that? We don't think of the wind as being animate, do we? Um, but again... What did we just talk about with water or natural forces? So in the same way, water forces can be associated with spirits that control them or natural spirits that control them. The other strong forces of nature can be considered the same, wind. And so the idea that Jesus rebukes the wind within this context is Jesus rebuking the spirit that controls the wind, which is an interesting, interesting thing. So. Um, which also, as we go into the next passages, ties in very strongly with the next story, which is going to be one of the more famous um, exorcism stories in all of scripture. And so it's sort of already set the stage um, there. All right, any other thoughts or questions on this section? You know, something about the, the fishermen, you know, if you, the way I think of it is if you take a small craftsman, like in Tennessee, got a pickup truck and a trailer full of tools, right? Maybe one or two helpers. 
anything beyond that requires an, an economic investment that's beyond anything they can do. So if you have a fisherman back in, oh, in any part of East or West Africa, or any Asia is where everybody's fishing and it's a smaller family business, think of a small boat, 15 or 20 feet, one or two guys help them, somebody who met the nets. Anything larger than that requires you to either be, I don't know, a Roman entrepreneur. Or yeah, that's true. Yeah. Greek, um, that's true. Yeah. It, it, it exceeds anybody's ability. So they, they really were just kind of like common, ordinary folks. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. I they I that's I think that's a good and fair description. I imagine there are some people that did fishing in the sea there that were wealthy enough to have slaves to to assist in that. Now maybe the slaves weren't necessarily, you know, skilled enough to be folks on the water. Maybe they were the, just the people taking the nets in from the boats to put the fish or getting ready, preparing to fish. I don't know, but that is a good way to think of it because I doubt we're dealing with like large corporations of things here. Um, you know, there just wouldn't have been. I don't know. Honestly, there wouldn't have been the wood. It's not like there's a lot of trees around these areas. They must have brought this stuff down from Lebanon and other areas like that to get these boats. So, all right. Um, so uh, th this sets up a another dichotomy in Mark where he's pitting faith and fear against one another. Um, I, I, we can go into that a little bit later. I'm going to save a little some of that for sermons. Um because that, that can be, those can be troublesome sort of interpreting those sort of things because they can often be used as a cudgel against other folks. Um, I, I will say what his description of faith here is often used in a, or the language Mark is using to describe faith versus fear is he's using faith typically in its Greek context in the, the version or the, uh, the way the verb is declined um, as a way to not describe a momentary thing. It's more of fear. Fear is a faith is a lifestyle and faith is something that is persistent as opposed to a mo momentary feeling. Just as fear is a lifestyle, it is a series of choices or an orientation to the future, not just an individual moment. So um, when he, you know, when he chastises the disciples for being afraid, it's not just that they're terrified of the storm. It's that they don't understand who he is and therefore don't find their safety in him. So I think any of us would say it would be absolutely reasonable if I was on a cruise ship and a rogue wave hit me. Uh, I, I think it would be absolutely reasonable to say, yes, that is a fearful situation. So when Jesus is talking faith and fear, he's not talking about these isolated singular incidents. He's talking about their orientation both towards life and to him. So, and to be fair, in our interpretation of this, we do have to leave room, in my opinion, for Mark's intentional use of hyperbole and humor in order to tell this story to make a stronger point. So uh, let's move on a little bit. We're going to move into um, Mark 5, uh, 1 through 20, and where we have, um, could we have another volunteer to read um, read let's see let's just do uh one through five would someone read one through five for us oh, volunteer okay i'm gonna i'm gonna hand you a little microphone bob if that's all right just so you can read that aloud for us there you go i can't screw it up right no you're good none, none to mess up <laughs> uh, mark five they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when he had come out of the boat, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit who lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, even with a chain, for he had often been bound with fetters and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart and the fetters he broke in pieces and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out, and bruising himself with stone. One to five. Yep, that's it. You got it. Let me, I'll take that back. Thank you, sir. Sir. So the first thing we have to deal with here is this is where, this is an area of Mark's gospel that relates to why people think Mark couldn't have written it in Galilee. And the reason is Mark does not seem to have a very good handle on geography. So no, uh, so no, no, it's, it's, it's a little different than that. So um, there, there it says that Mark says they're going to the country of the Gerizines. 
Um, now, I want you to look at your map and I want you to find, if you're those that have a map here, I want you to find, if you could, where Garissa is. Is that, uh, Garissa, if you're someone who's looked at a map here that has a map of the Decapolis, it is nowhere near the lake. So it's not just crossing a lake. It is some 60 uh, kilometers away. That is, if you were to go there, and I've actually been there, that's in Jordan. It's the it's the modern city of Jerash. It's one of the, if, if you're going to go to Jordan, it's one of the places you must go to. It is an archaeological wonder. It would have been considered one of the largest cities in the ancient world. It is one of the best preserved um main sort of uh, roadways through just lined with columns. They call it the city of a thousand columns. I mean, it's just, it's an unbelievable place. Multiple theaters, um, you know, mul multiple nymphams in great condition. It's amazing. That's nowhere near the sea, right? But, but there's lots of disagreement here, um, but most scholars seem to think what we're actually talking about is the town of Gadara, because Matthew, in Matthew's recording of the story, doesn't say they're going to the land of the Gerizines. They say they're going to the land of the Gedarines. It's kind of it's kind of similar, right? Kind of similar there, and it makes a lot more sense uh, to describe as just going across the way if you're going to Gadara as opposed to um, Gezara. Sorry, the, the problem when you talk, start talking about these names is they have been through a hundred different iterations between now and then. So Gadara or Gasara Garasso becomes Jirash and a million other things. So, um, so this is where one of those theories comes that like we don't think Mark when he was writing this was a Gal was a Galilean or was in Galilee when he was writing it because if he was he wouldn't have messed up some of the geography so bad. And there's other examples of this. So these cities are a part of what is called the Decapolis, the 10 cities. And what's important to know about this is when it says he crosses to the other side, that language is doing a lot of work. And the work it's doing is it's saying we are going from the Jewish area to the Roman area. Capernaum was largely Jewish. There would have been some Romans. There was a centurion station there. There would have been certainly that presence because of its economic importance. But if you go to the other side, it's not Jewish ter territory. This is Roman territory. So this is a, another example of Jesus being the line crosser. He's going to the other side of the lake. He is physically sort of crossing that line into new more Roman territory, and he's going to work and speak among Romans. So that that is something that is absolutely present in all of these, uh, or in this story in particular. So um, let's see. Uh, the city really doesn't make a whole lot of difference in the story. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I, I think you're right. It could be, it when he says the region of, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the city. And I think the fact that we're dealing with someone possessed, um, there's there's some other information here we'll talk about. So um, they describe this person. Let's let's look specifically at the description of this unclean spirit. He stepped out of the boat and immediately a man out of the tombs. Did you catch that? Out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. And so um, tombs were not located in cities. So this confrontation with this demon possessed man, um, we know right from the get go, it's not in the city. It's out of the city because no city puts their tombs in their city. So he it that that's a component of this. Um, in the ancient world, sleeping inside tombs um, would have been considered one of the four or five hallmark signs of madness. So you would people that sit or sleep in tombs, people that stay up all night, people that yell for no reason, or people that smash things when you give them to them. Those are sort of the four main signs of this person's got something not right with them. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, I think we could, I think maybe our culture shift a little bit on the people that stay up all night, maybe are seen as, as madness, but maybe some of the other ones would have been similar. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Uh, um, yeah, so I mean, I don't think some of these have changed. Now, it's interesting that, that they weren't, they had a little degree of sophistication in their understanding of this. They didn't automatically assume that someone behaving this way had an unclean spirit. That would have been one of the possibilities to explore. 
Um, because uh, an understanding of an unclean spirit could be interesting. It could be an unclean spirit external to them that was tormenting them, that led them to leave in this way, or it could have been an unclean spirit that had come in and possessed them that was tormenting and doing that. There's some other factors that I'm not familiar with terribly well, um, but, but you know that's sort of what's going on, um, that Jesus is encountering one of these people, people that sit inside of tombs. Within our own Bible, this is referenced in Psalm 65, Psalm 67, are both references um, of uh, people sitting inside tombs, which cons- the insinuation would be, if you're sitting inside tombs, that you're consulting with the dead. You're talking with dead people, which would have been a sign of madness. This is condemned in Deuteronomy 18. Um, They also refer to things in Psalm 65 as spending the night in secret places. Um, People, I guess, just finding weird caves and things in the wilderness or eating swine's flesh as being signs of unclean or potentially maddening behavior. So uh, Jerash, if they really did go to Jerash or the tombs of Jerash happened to be 50, 60 miles from Jerash, um, that would have been a really... um, prominent city in the Decapolis, um, really wealthy, as I sort of described uh, earlier. But as we said, it's not likely that they were there. Um, Caves, uh, I'm sorry, tombs were shallow caves, often carved into hillsides. Uh, The demoniac, this is where he found his shelter in them. Um, The description of the man also sort of implies that he's a Gentile. We're not talking about a Jew. We're already in an area where there's a lot of Gentiles, a lot of Romans, but this man, there's some descriptions there that tend to make him sound like a Gentile himself. Um, Do you notice the description? He's so wild that no one can restrain him. Um, Shackles and chains were used to restrain prisoners. Uh, We see this in Acts, but this demoniac tears these apart. He smashed his chains, smashed his shackles uh, in a way that one would crush an alabaster flask is how Matthew tells this part of the story. So he smashes these things as though they are uh, nothing. So let's move on. Let's actually talk about this confrontation uh, between Jesus and this demon. Uh, Would someone read for us six through 10? We have someone that would be agree to do that for us. Anyone? All right, I'm gonna hand you a microphone. Six through ten. When he saw Jesus, it's got a different, a little bit different version. It's okay. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him, and he shouted at the top of his voice, "What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me." For he has said to him, "Come out of the man, you unclean spirit." Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. He right. begged him. Earnestly. We can stop there. We'll, we'll just analyze those. So six through 10. Yep. Yep. All right. A couple things to note here. Um, Jesus is recognized. The demon runs to him. Again, running would have been something that wouldn't have been smiled upon. I mean, that would have been a sign of madness. Uh, which is an interesting translation for the uh, uh, prodigal son where the father runs. It would have been seen as dishonorable for a grown male to run unless they were participating in one of the uh, sporting contests in the Roman Empire. The demoniac is the one that takes the initiative. Jesus isn't the one coming to him. It's the demon that is coming to, the demon-possessed man that's coming to Jesus. And it says, "What is? does anyone have different words there in verse 6 where it says he ran down and bowed before him? Did anyone else say anything different than that? What does your say? Fell on his knees in front of him. Anyone else say something there? It's... It is a difficult word to fully understand. Uh, it's the, um, the, the word is proskinein, um, and it is a, it's a compound verb that's taking two words and putting it together. Um, often we translate it as pros, um, prostrate. Um, you see that a lot in Revelation. Um, it is an act of worship, but, but it's a weird combination of words of to kiss, to kiss before. That's the two words that are shoved together there, but it's used in this context of worship or begging a superior. Um, Maybe there was an original context that you fell down at someone's feet and kissed their feet. 
that 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 is probably maybe the root of this but it doesn't necessarily mean this demon did that because it's meaning and most likely had shifted and context shifts meaning as well but it is an act of worship of a deity it is, or a, or the recognition of someone more powerful than you maybe a vassal would go to their suzerain the ruler to ask for something to beg for them and they would have fallen on their face this is an important narrative point because this happens here but it's going to happen in the next story and it's going to happen in the next story that same verb there to prostrate to fall down to kiss before on one knees before a superior um, to express, it says some um, some ancient dictionaries define it as to express an attitude or gesture, of one's complete dependence or submission to a high authority figure. So that that's what's happening there. He proceeds um, to declare Jesus's identity, um, and I I think what is something is so interesting about this is who is it that is calling out to Jesus? Is it the unclean spirits that are calling out to Jesus? Or is it the demon himself calling out to Jesus? Because there's a bit of a paradox within this passage because um, all of creation is not as equal battle between God and Satan or God and Lucifer. 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 It's not an equal contest. It's not a contest at all. The fallen against the creator. So even even evil has becomes an understanding of who God. Is. Certainly, yeah, cer yeah, certainly that's true. It, we we've seen evil spirits before recognize Jesus and bow down to his authority, but it is an interesting thing when the man bows down before him. Who is the one doing the bowing? Is it the demons because they recognize Jesus' authority, or is it the man doing it because he's begging for his? Um, for the expulsion, after the spirit is done exercising, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I think ultimately there's not an answer to this. I just think it's an interesting question because, you know, in a modern world where we're always very concerned with agency, who has the agency to make this choice? Here's a story where it's not entirely clear who is making that choice. So, Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jesus is definitely responding to a spirit in there and the spirit is responding to that. Um, but it, it, it's also hard to know at times who's doing what and that, and that's okay. That's an important component of the story. So um, this is where we get the famous, my name is Legion for we are many. Um, there's a lot of ink being spilt on what those things mean. I, in my opinion, I think the most, um, I think the most likely definition for that is a legion were the primary unit of the Roman army. During most of the first century, there were uh, 25 to 28 Roman legions in total. There were around 5,000 infantry in each. Um, and so there were 10 cohorts of 480 within that. Now, there is a smaller division of the Roman. I can't remember the name. It's in my notes here somewhere. That's around 2,048 individuals. Because when we talk about the actual size of the swine, around 2,000, there's probably a closer connection there. Um, Roman legions, their mascot was a wild boar. And so there, there, there is, remember, what does the gospel of Mark begin with? This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, son of God, which is, as we learned, is a pretty strong polemic against the emperor. Jesus is the real son of God, not the emperor. Jesus is the one with authority, not the emperor. There's an element here where Jesus goes into the emperor's land, confronts someone that seems to be possessed by a name that sounds like the emperor's armies, and Jesus is responding to that. That's not to say this story is entirely metaphorical or made up, but there is an element of that as we try to interpret what is going on here. So that name Legion is most likely a reference to something <laughs> that we would have been aware of. Um, so another component of this, some people have interpreted this in the past, is Romans saw themselves as bringing peace and prosperity everywhere they went, but the people who were the subjects of that, that peace often felt like oppression. So in a symbolic sense, this story also oper operates as a way of a messiah throwing off the impression of the legions. 
else, which is an interesting way of interpreting it. I don't know, do with that what you will, but I think at least as you're trying to understand <laughs> Legion, that's where it's coming from. A large group of soldiers, it would have been people's minds. Maybe they made the connection to a boar's head because that would have been, they would have had a boar's head on their garrisons. They would have been on symbols on things. That's, you know, particularly when we get the expelling of the demon into the swamp. So um, you notice that this demon's exposure with Jesus brings out a bit of an existential crisis. He yells that kind of wild phrase, um, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Um, that's another interesting element of why people think Jesus, uh, this uh, demon-possessed man, would have been a, a Gentile. Because son of the most high God would have been a uniquely ex, uh, Gentile expression. Because it's not, uh, it's not identifying the God of Isaac, Isaac Abraham, Jacob. Uh, Most high God is a more Gentile expression about the highest of gods among the council of gods. So that's just an interesting little fact about that. But he does seem to recognize Jesus as something. He seems to take Jesus's presence as a threat to his ability to maintain possession of this man. It's a slightly different version of somebody coming to Jesus for healing. So you have people lowering down somebody through a house. You have a woman tugging in her his mm -hmm. So unlike the physical healing that we've seen so far, uh, if we were to say in modern terms, he's got a very bad chemical imbalance. So he's coming to Jesus. I don't. I don't. I don't know how to. I, I don't know how to apply. I'm not one to tr to theorize what a condition described in ancient terms is in the modern world. Right. The closest we come on that is maybe some people clearly seem to have something that could be defined as epilepsy. But beyond that, I don't know what to make of this. And I, I, I don't want to be presumptuous to say what this is or not. But, but I would argue, yeah. But I would, I would argue this is not, I mean, this is, this is healing. What it, it, this is physical. I mean, he's living in tombs. It, it's clearly ravaging him in the ancient world. Uh, I'm going to talk about this Sunday. So pay attention to this particular Sunday. But it's not... But in the ancient world, who cares? Because these illnesses are what separate you from your community. Disease and illness are seen as two distinctly different things. We're concerned with disease. What is the physical process that has happened to you? But the ancient world is concerned with illness, meaning this is the thing that has made you ritualistic, unclean, or brought you dishonor and has separated you from the community. And so a demon possession or a man with a withered hand are not really seen as that different to them because they're both things that have affected physically that have separated them from their culture. And so, you know, I, I don't think if you are analyzing these stories from that lens, there's a massive difference between Jesus healing, you know, like we'll talk about on Sunday, the woman, that, the hemorrhaging woman that touches his cloak and this is not that much different other than there seems to be another creature or a something in this that is able to identify Jesus as the son of God. But the, the bounds of the story are relatively simple, that the, the problem with the demon possession is this man is not participating in his society. And as we'll see at the end of the story, what Jesus tells him to do is like, go back and live a normal, proper life. So um, let's move on. Let's, let's, pick up, let's pick up at verse 11. Um, oh, I do want to point out one other thing, too, is... And this is one of the things that affects people's interpretation of this is verse 10. Notice that notice that's really interesting there. He says, he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Isn't that interesting that this legion of demons is okay with the idea of being exercised, but it's like, well, it's almost like the demon saying, look, I kind of like this area. Don't send me out of this area. Isn't that kind of strange? Isn't that kind of, yeah, that's kind mm -hmm. of strange. That's one of the things where people have sort of pointed to and said, that might be doing some work here to talk about. This is a, you know, this is a Roman predominant area. This person, you know, these demons have that association. Don't send me out of Rome. That, that I don't know. I think that's an interesting feature of the story that the demon seems to really like it where they live. So, <laughs> so all right. Uh, who would read verse uh, verses uh, 11 through 13? All right. Right. Linda, I got you next. All right. So. Okay. 
Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirit begged him, send us into the swine, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, stampeded down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. All right. Yep. I mean, I, I don't know about that. I don't know if they would be mindful of that. I think the biggest element of the story would just be Jews don't eat pork, you know, or don't. And not only not only that, just don't don't even associate. I mean, I mean, so there there's. Yeah. So there's multiple levels on this is this this man, as a result of this possession, has, is being dehumanized in every way. Everything that would identify in that human being as the image of God has been stripped from him. And on top of that, uh, there's this swine association at the end, which is certainly would been tinged in um, uncleanliness. Um, let's see. Just want to make sure I have my notes. Oh, a battalion. A battalion is 2,048 people. So there's some kind of funniness going on there with the word. Um, so uh, let's see. All right. Um, the pig, of course, is unclean to Jewish law. Um, I think most people say that 2000 has no necessarily numerological significance when the Bible uses numbers they don't often aren't necessarily, you know, seven doesn't mean seven, 12 doesn't mean 12, you know, 40 doesn't mean 40. They're often used symbolically that I don't think that's happening here. It probably just was like saying the ancient equivalent of saying a lot, or there was that symbolism of um, a battalion size or those known norm numbers at play um, that would have been there. Quite a striking visual image, right? Bunch of pigs getting possessed and running themselves off a cliff, jumping into the water, uh, or I guess running down a steep bank into the sea and being drowned. Um, there's a lot been made there about what this could have meant. Could the, the subsequent anger or frustration Jesus had, would it have been more to do with his power, his authority, or would it have been the economic impact of a loss of a sub of line? Yeah. Yeah. I think rhetorically speaking in the responses that come, I think Mark's not necessarily trying to say that, but I think that's also a blunt reality. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about 14 through 17. Linda, would you read that for us? Those tending the pigs, <clears throat> excuse me, ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw a man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. <laughs> plead with this man with so much power to get out of there yeah that's a really interesting facet of the story um so i think there's an interesting parallel here i don't think it is intentional well it couldn't have been but i think it's something interesting to point out i'm, I'm good bob sure. yep um there were trades that would have been considered they were called the despised trades and we have ancient uh well we have parts of the talmud actually out, outline some of this for ancient jews it says a man should not teach his son to be an ass driver or a camel driver or a barber or a sailor or a herdsman or a shopkeeper for their craft is the craft of robbers nothing else would change we have some you know this is something that we have in the the talmud so barber don't be someone who drives donkeys. Don't be someone who is, drives camels. Don't cut hair. Don't be a sailor. Now, a sailor, sailor and a fisher are different. Um, a herdsman or a shopkeeper. So a herding, herding animals was a despised trade because herders were regarded as being dishonest drifters whose flocks grazed over people's land and crops. 
So that's that's one of the dishonesty. It's like I don't like those herders because they're taking that sheep onto my land and they're eating up my food. Yep. How, what is a herder different than a shepherd? Oh, shepherds are despised. Okay. Yeah, they are. They're, 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 they're the youngest, they're the most isolated. They're, the class, yeah, they're, yeah. they're not the elder son inheriting all the land. Yep. So remember, remember, let's think. What is the thing that cues the prodigal son into, all right, I've hidden rock bottom? He's having to eat with the pigs. He's eating with the pigs, which means he's tending to the pigs. He has hit rock bottom. Now, let's connect that through with the Gospels that decided to borrow from Mark and came after it. Who are some of the people that announced the birth of Jesus? Shepherds. That's an inter It's another facet of how the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is, a, is the news about a kingdom that doesn't make any sense. This story in many ways mirrors that. They're the ones, it's the shepherds, the people watching the pigs, the people that are drifters, cheats, liars, and they're tending to unclean animals are the ones that go into the Roman cities and tell them about what this man has done. Isn't that wild? But, but it's also thing that we see all through the Old Testament. I've just been struck by this from David, the shepherd, the youngest. Yep. Joseph, liar. David's shepherd that was youngest that his father didn't even think was worthy of being considered. Yeah. And you know, Jacob and Esau, and then Jacob, you know, doing these dishonest, you know, not the last guy, a cheat, kind of cheating kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And yet the guys who end up being the hero. Yep. What does that leave behind? Most yep. of that some likelihood and help explain why the disciples never really understand what's going on. I mean, the whole, the yeah. whole it is it is it's a i mean it's just, this kingdom of god <laughs> jesus is talking about is is almost like a mirror upside down image of what people expected out of things you know he jesus saves the world through life-giving love and death as opposed to being the wielder of power and triumph um and so and the messengers are not the people you would trust to be messengers it's women people working in distrustful um, professions, eunuchs, slaves. It's people you wouldn't necessarily associate with being the most trustworthy or honored of messengers. And I, I, I find that incredibly liberating and to be fascinating. So um, this happens, the swine go out, they begin to beg Jesus, you know, please get out of here, please get out of here. And Jesus seems to be okay with it. He gets in the boat. He's gone across the water, had the storm. I think it's interesting how willing they're jump, willing to jump back in that boat and head back the other way again. But he hops in. As he's getting into the boat, the man possessed with demons uh, begged him that he might be with him. And that, so this is interesting. that it, it's He's begging Jesus, can I be one of your disciples? That's what he's, he's saying there. Can I be one of your disciples? I see him here. Can I be one of your disciples? To which Jesus responds in a way that's very different from other parts of Mark. And we don't quite know what to make about this. Other parts of Mark, Jesus does a miracle or does something big. And what does he tell people? Shh, don't tell anyone. But what is he, you know, so earlier with the, the leper, you know, the, the story of don't tell anyone. And the leper doesn't listen, goes around, blabs to everyone. But here, Jesus tells him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. Here is different. Jesus is telling him to do this. Now, some people have interpreted this as this is Mark speaking symbolically about the expansion of the gospel to the Gentiles, mm -hmm. because he obviously, as we've talked about, Mark is writing in a context where the church would have been either equally divided or maybe a little more Gentile than Jew. So I, I don't know what to make of it, but I do think it's interesting because in every other instance, Jesus is telling people not to say anything. It's called the messianic secret. We'll talk about that a little more in a, in a different time. Is this region a little bit short of synagogues and Pharisees, mostly Romans with a Greek background? Yeah, I mean, that's why I said the Decapolis is exclusively Roman cities. There may have been synagogues and cities. I mean, I'm trying to remember when I was in Jerash, if we even went in one. It, there certainly went a bit. Jews were all over the ancient world. And Jews had a funny status within the Roman world where they had exceptions, 
where they didn't have to worship the emperor in the same way. And there was a funny, Romans had a funny infatuation with Jews, thought of them as being exotic and the religion being sort of funky in, the, in many ways how Americans have often thought about Eastern religions. I would say that's a good comparison. Um, so they would, have, they would have been in these places, but you know, the Jewish faith back then wouldn't have been a, like an evangelical faith. They wouldn't have gone into these cities to try to convert these cities. They just, you know, the synagogues would have been invest, invested for Jews they are living their life. So, you know, yeah, what, yeah, this is, I think this is certainly representing the expansion of the gospel to Gentiles. Um, and he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. So it's wild. It's like they're amazed, but they don't want him there. <laughs> this is amazing. I hear about all these things that happen. Get out of here, Jesus. It's it's a really interesting thing. So um, we will pick up on Sunday at verse 21 and talk about another couple healing stories, which um, which you will know come hot on the heels of this and share those same elements as part of that like sandwich story. And you will be able to keep in mind that whole prostrate thing, the to kiss before to lie down face first in front of someone because it's going to happen multiple times again when we read on Sunday. Uh, any other any other questions? Yeah, and that's strange. Yes, yeah, that is that is, that's a great interesting point. Is that when he's demon possessed, the demons are begging not to be sent out of the region. The when the with the man, demons are excised and the man is of his full agency, he's restored back to the image of, um, you know, the image of God is seen in him. His desire is to leave the country to follow Jesus. That's a great point, Hazel. I love that. That's great. Any other thoughts or things, questions that have popped out as a result of reading this, working through this? Name as many people with a, with a common name as some of the other names. So they name after name after name. This is pretty much kind of the pared down story. Yeah, I mean, that's we talked about in the first week. That's why Mark Mark's not using as many proper names. That's true. Um, that's part of the reason why people earlier thought um, Mark was someone who just was summarizing Matthew. You know, that I think that was some of the reason for that, even though, you know, obviously we now know uh, difficult. Um, it's his with the first gospel. Is we give Luke credit for spending a lot of time trying to show him as many de details and names and things as possible. Yeah. It's just at different times, points in the spectrum of trying to get all this information together. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think one one theory why the people were so freaked out by Jesus, um, you know, in this exorcism, um, obviously there was the economic impact, but some people have made the argument that Mark doesn't necessarily give us a reason why the people were terrified that Jesus did that. But some people have said that it's entirely reasonable for the people upon hearing or seeing this miracle could have presumed that Jesus was in league with the demon. So if you think about it, he has power over the demons, and then his way of exercising power liberates this one person, but results in this pretty wild, catastrophic scene. It wouldn't be much of a stretch to be like, what is this guy doing, commanding demons to do these things? This is such a malicious thing. And so that that could have been a reason on, you know, that could have been, there was certainly an economic reason for the person, but, you know, those weren't your pigs, who cares? I think for the other people, it more would have been an aspect of fear um so so Paul yeah. didn't make any friends with the people who did religious icons and stuff in their day, right? Say that again. Uh, Paul didn't he get kicked out of a couple of cities for oh yeah, 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 yeah. They tried to kill him in Ephesus. I mean he got you know, and it was only stopped at the last second when the local administrator finally caught news of it. it yeah. People don't like change, right? Yeah, and I mean, well like change. They don't like a new road. And they're they're seeing they're seeing things they'd never seen before. Um there's this weird, you know, you just don't quite understand the relationship between the natural world and the spirit world. And Jesus is not exactly being forthcoming about his motivations all over the place. 
um, you know, here's this Jew that's coming across, you know, if they had the, if the Jews had the relationship that that's the Roman side, certainly the Romans would have understood the different world on the other side. And here's this outsider coming in here and doing this act of power. That's, you know, that's pretty terrifying. Now, this isn't the last time Jesus is going to go into the Decapolis uh, in two more, in two chapters and seven, when we get to seven, you know, he's kind of ping-ponging back and forth across the, the lake. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's what he's doing. Uh, so he's going to hear in a second in verse 21, hop back on the boat and start heading the other way. So uh, this time they seem to get across without a big terrifying storm. But um, so Jesus is going to come back to the Decapolis here in a little bit. And so this news of Jesus is already spreading. We'd already seen evidence of this in Galilee, right? When Jesus healed someone earlier. And then he comes back to a place later and think about that with um, what was happening at Peter's mother, uh, Peter's mother-in-law's house. Jesus is there visiting her. He's in that place. And all of a sudden, all these people show up demanding healing. So news of Jesus is traveling around the region and it creates the scenario where people might step out of line or do things beyond what's expected of them in order to encounter Jesus, which is a major theme in the next couple of stories. So, all right. Yeah, yeah. I can talk about it a little bit. So the Decapolis, so the, it's the earliest listing of these 10 cities. That's what it means. It just means 10 cities. Police means city. So, you know, Indianapolis, Indianapolis means Indiana city. That's so Decapolis just means Deca police, 10 cities. Um, so the earliest, um, the earliest we have of it is this guy named uh, Pliny, um, who's a, a historian so I actually have a quote from him he's talking about. It. He says, adjoining Judea on the side of Syria is the region of Decapolis, so called from the number of its towns. Though not all writers keep to the same towns on the list, most, however, include Damascus with its fertile water meadows that drain the river Cerisioe. Philadelphia. Now there's lots of different Philadelphias. This is not the Philadelphia listed. This is not the Philadelphia listed in Revelation because that would be in Turkey. Um, so uh, Raphaena, all these three withdrawn towards Arabia. Scythopolis, formerly Nyssa, after Father Liber's nurse, whom he buried there, were a colony of Scythians. Now Scythians are all the way from up at the Black Sea. These are like pirates from the Black Sea. They're all, they come down there. Colony of Scythians settled. Uh, Gadara, uh, past which flows the river Yamuk, Hippo or Hippos. Mentioned early already, Dion Pella, rich with its waters, uh, Galassia, Galassa, or also known as Garasa and Kanatha. That's so. That's, I mean, that's what we understand of it. But I mean, if you would go there now, there's there's modern cities in a lot of these, but not all of these. So they they certainly had prominence at some point. But I I, I don't know if as the power of Rome receded because these are pretty tough areas to live. If these cities themselves would have diminished. Um, Modern Jerash is a pretty, still a pretty lot, a sizable city, um, but I, I, I don't know. You have the cities that are bigger than yellow, but the black cities, those are the ten. Yes, yeah. So the one in yellow, and in and in here, they're trying to be reflected larger as a regional. Um, there in the orange, so um, the yeah, the red. Mm -hmm. um, are you talking the map on the left? On the left, the ones listed, the ones listed in red, would have been seen as Judean cities. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, all right. Uh, any other last questions before we finish up today? Otherwise, let's um, let me close us in prayer, and then we'll dismiss. God, thank you for. Um, people of faith that pass these stories on to us, that research about these stories, that help them to come alive as we read them and study them together. Thank you for your kingdom, which at times makes no sense. It's upside down where the weak are powerful and the powerful are brought down. Help us to be people that search that kingdom, search to be people who serve with that selfless love we see modeled in Jesus. Uh, make us into that community, make us into that people. Amen.